I'm just going to start. Thanks, everybody, for this. This is awesome. Uh, I grew up in Idaho. Uh, if you don't know where that is, go all the way west and just come back a little bit. Um, and I found out a couple years ago the word Idaho is a made-up word. And I wrote a poem about growing up in Idaho, and it has nothing to do with that after the first stanza. So, uh, And there's also an epigram, which is, I always say epigraph. I think that's the one on the tomb. Uh, and it's the, it's the state motto for Idaho, which is, mayest thou live forever. And that comes in at the end, so remember that. That's your homework. All right. Uh, it's called Idaho History. Referring to the territory itself, the Comanches said Idahie. The Plains Apache used it too, but there it meant enemy. In the 1860s, a Mr. Willing said that Idaho was a Shoshone phrase, a lie, although the sun did seem to come from the mountains. There was no shortage of outside places to explore. I remember raspberries swimming under bridges, garter snakes in mason jars, holding open barbed wire fences with two hands and a foot. My eyes never left the ground in the foothills. I'd scour the dirt, hoping each stone was an arrowhead, slicing dead reeds for Indian gum. At the fourth grade rendezvous, I traded three beadwork geckos for leather pouches, perfect for holding water rocks and sagebrush lizards. I caught one on Squaw Butte. His tail flicked my fingers. His ventral patches were blue and he was squishy. Esto perpetua, I said, and flung him through the air. All right, that didn't hurt. Um, <laughs> second one, uh, this is about <laughs> my grandparents dying, which is darker than it sounds. Um, so my grandma lived in a very, very old part of Boise, and there were three cherry trees along her driveway that I grew up basically under. And um, yeah, I'm, that's all I'm going to tell you. So this one's called Under the Cherry Trees. The trees die from the top down every summer, beautiful for a few weeks. The grass below them grows in the dark. Ripping it out of the ground kept her alive for a decade after he died, opening the blinds to see them blow in the wind. One root gnarled its way out of the earth. Grandpa is a green chair, grandma is the grass. The kitchen separates their deaths. My brother found her on the carpet, face down, he said, like she was sleeping. I celebrate holidays sweet seated between their names, fixing the flowers and wiping my face, shadows moving, the grass remembering the shape of my body. Um, on a not that lighter note, uh, most people don't know southern Idaho is a desert. Northern Idaho looks like Alaska. Uh, everybody drives through southern Idaho, so they have no idea, which means there's more fish for me, uh, <laughs> which is cool. Um, but I actually grew up in a quote-unquote desert where there was kind of nothing. Um, so this is called a sunset anywhere else. The desert turning into darkness is spectacular. There is nothing uninhabited by light. The rocks porous in appearance but impermeable, migrate, scratching trails in the crusted earth just waiting to be ground to dust. Where are they going? Nowhere is any place unscarred by fences. This place is full of it. The words we use, untamable and barren, parched and bad, strip it. The arid mountains act as sentinels, oblivious to their slow unpeeling. Nature knows you aren't looking for the harsh beauty holed up in her heart. If only you had stayed. Uh, this place is called, oh, this poem, this place. Uh, this poem is called Goblin. Uh, I originally wrote it about a goblin shark, which is, don't Google it, they're scary. Um, I didn't know what they were, and I'm never going to swim again. Um, so, and also there's a Shakespeare reference in this. If you get it, then... You're pretentious like me. <laughs> All right. It's called Goblin. It's pretty short. I have no words for the sea. The water of my childhood moved only in the wind or when displaced. The moon here is tilted, orange when it sheds its chrysalis, a nightly occurrence worthy of worship. Listen, listen, oh, listen. The ancient apparition walks the waves. 
extinct once, the rocking resurrects itself, singing the sound of your name like a body engulfed. Uh, I have no idea what this poem is about, so <laughs> it's called Prompt. Prompt. You recognize the man holding out his hand, perhaps from childhood. Step out and down. You will settle softly into something before you know it. Something is gone. What is missing, the change, violent but without pain, like a tearing of paper, settles into place invisibly as before. You are here. Be here. Attempt to persuade the leaves away from the tree, holding your breath. Remind yourself the shadows move as they move. Everything here, sidewalk cracks, the texture of shingles, familiar but somehow more hushed. Uh, okay, uh, this poem is called Fractals. I wrote this um, on the, standing on the Charles River waiting for the regatta to go by. Um, <laughs> my friend Lisa, who is a way better poet than I am, uh, actually I could not figure out how to finish this poem and I was started walking down the river through the crowds and she walked by. So the end of this poem is a tribute to her who couldn't make it tonight. So it's called Fractals. Dwarfed by other forms of life, the leaves fall into this world without cadence that changes colors each time it kisses something goodbye. Adieu to God. That is the type of farewell we all seek in our own way. You are new in my life, measure how you will. One day, you will be older than everyone, assuming nothing invisible calls your name early. Until then, I will teach you my language. The trick is not guessing where the leaves will land. The trick is deciding where they started before the drying spot they left has time to forget. Apologies. This poem only illuminates the paradox of poems. Write them down, and the feeling is gone. Wait, and the feeling is gone. I stopped to eat, it crept down the stairs to blow away in the wind. I hope the holes will slow it down. In the fuss of these half-colored fragments of trees, your eyes are the only blue. Okay, um, despite growing up in Idaho, I do not hunt. So this is a poem about hunting. Uh, it's called Game. Pheasants burst from the field like the outside edge of a splash, their wing beats stepping on and over each other, almost like applause. From far away, each one is lost in the scatter. The flock, or what is now becoming the flock, veers in the bob and weave of panicked flight. It has worked for generations, why not now? After the gunshot's interruption runs its course, they return more annoyed than afraid to the ground. No nostalgia nothing remembered. They hop from place to place or stick and swivel earthward to turn the tiny clods that may be hiding dinner. How long does a bird stay full? It is important for the hunter to know where they concentrated before. Where they have been and are not now, a carcass lies. It must be stuck and gutted, dried and smoked before the sun goes down, before the flock grows wary of the dusk and tired of flight before the gather and the hush, the barrel's humming tip, cool to the touch. Uh, this is another poem about dead birds. Um, <laughs> if you're one of the people that thinks that a poem is a sonnet just because it's 14 lines long, it's also a sonnet. Uh, <laughs> I can't rhyme, so Kevin, shout out to you. I heard some of your stuff, and it was, you're way better at it than I am. Uh, so this one's called The Beginning of Feathers. The speckled shells will be ugly and loud before long. At least one will fling itself skyward and die, a pink stain on the ground. The beginning of feathers stuck to its wings. The soft sound of soft bodies breaking the edge of their hard world, only to find it is cold in the next, echoes not very far at all. All mouth these baby birds regret the warm twist of branches, reminding them to leave is to find yourself back in a place you just left. Uh, okay, this one is called As the World Giveth. Um, 
So the other thing, although I grew up in Idaho, I did not grow up on a farm, but my parents now live on a plot of land that is literally surrounded by farms. But my dad's a CPA, which is cool, because <laughs> uh, then we can eat. Uh, we don't have to grow it. So this one's called As the World Giveth. I wrote it. I'm only saying that because I wrote this on their porch when they first moved there. As the world giveth. A mile or two from here, a silo sits. Nothing special. Light concrete filled with grain, I imagine. Tipping the scale neither out of spring nor into summer. It will not look round for long, silhouetted once the sun sets. You can see the hills tuck it in, each casting its last shadow, each cloud alive in turn as brilliance rolls across uninterrupted sky, orange to pink, deep blue, seeming soon to swallow the stars. Behind me, the moon rose. At any given time, there is peace somewhere in this world. Yes, tonight it is mine, the whisper of sprinklers singing the crickets to sleep. Uh, and this poem is self-explanatory. It's called, I Wish the Moon. I wish I was the moon. I wish you were the moon. I wish the moon was me and I was you and you were the moon. I would tell myself to stay and you would say, I'm growing larger by descent. And the moon would say, I'm sorry, but this is all so confusing. And we would say, I wish I was the moon. We would all fall from the sky, hitting the earth in succession, raking a handful of dirt, placing a seed in each finger, returning the dirt, and reciting this prayer. Grow always in moonlight. Grow the direction you started. Grow through the soil and then grow some more to hell with the birds. And now that I said to hell with the birds, this is a poem about birds. <laughs> this one's called Grounded. A flock of geese changes direction the way water moves over an obstacle, an invisible motive to change trajectory. There doesn't have to be a reason, but there is. This is the only thing those geese know. They do not know they are Canadian. They only ever say one word. Maybe that's sufficient, but how will they know they have flown far enough? They do not name things. It must be a memory a recognition of the place they left to wither and hold still. Maybe they just feel it. Maybe they just decide they are tired. Okay, um, just a couple more. You guys are almost done, I promise. Uh, this one is called CSEA, like another fancy word for ocean. Um, I wrote this after, I, somewhere in New England, I don't remember where I was, when I first moved here, I might have been down in Rhode Island um, and we went to the ocean somewhere and it was foggy. I couldn't see anything and I love skipping rocks because I'm five So I was skipping rocks into the fog and I, I couldn't see like more than a foot past the shore and I just loved that idea um, There's another Shakespeare reference in this one. So if you're pretentious, you'll like this one too. C The night separates itself from the water forms appear an open mouth eye sockets everything shrouded in the same color. We finger the grooves in wet rock, flung just far enough to wonder if the body remembers how long it trusts itself to your bidding. Not all man-made, but not all sorcery. The place we walk is not quite land. It is all around our feet under the fog. Tell me, blind man, what breaks your fall when you pitch yourself into the mist and out of sight over the endless sand, the sound of your body, this thing we heard well before coming into view, startling the seabirds into the water. Okay, two more. This one's called kokanee, which is a type of salmon. Um, they're basically the, I, already, I looked this up and now I forgot it. They're the lake-dwelling type of salmon. So you have Chinook salmon who go to the ocean and then come back and swim up rivers and then die. Um, yeah, that's what they do. They reproduce and then they die. So, yeah. Um, also, a shout out to my mom. Uh, she had a really weird dream when I was growing up that there was a fish in the toilet. And instead of going bloop with its mouth, it was saying mom every time. So, mom. <laughs> mom. So between those, um, the only thing, other thing you need to know is the word milt is a fancy word for fish sperm. So there you go. It sounds more poetic. 
This one's called Kokanee. They bob like biplanes, hundreds of scarlet ripples in a river between lakes, waving in the current. Their eyes are angry, looking more like jelly, less like glass. How did they find their way back? You can see their mouths trying to say something over and over, something open and slow, like oh, or mom. None of it is particularly beautiful. The water looks smoky from time to time as the milt dissolves. If you take your shoes off, you can sift through fish. They slip around your legs like fat bars of soap, moving toward the bank once they finish, tilting sideways, letting the water breathe for them. It takes so much energy to change colors and come home to die. I'm going to skip to the second to the last one because I'm scared that I'm going over time. And this one's long. Uh, I wrote this about going to Cape Cod with my wife. Uh, it is based on real events. Uh, okay, it's called the Hyannis. If you haven't been there, there's a great used bookstore. Get down there. Beach is all right, too. Uh, it's called Hyannis again. The covered pier is private, so we settle for the concrete water break. The stalwart slabs all pin each other down like missing Stonehenge siblings, all fighting for a touch of home. The Kennedys live here. Their houses face the horse-shaped rock down the beach, also private. To touch it, we must leave our chiseled bridge, pull through the larger waves, rest on the neck, and swim again. Imagine washing up on a rich man's shore. The sand is only sand. It settles in the fist, abrasive burn and sifting where the fingers miss the most. Here come the cops. Cease imagining. At the end of the water break, a rusted ladder climbs a rusted light. This is the only shade. The tide moves inward. Soon enough, the lowest steps are gone, still visible, but slick and sharp, submerged. The wind ripples the waves. Now all the waves could be moving anywhere at all. Before this wind, I was the center of the ocean. The waves clamored for me, every splash a thrown tear as greedy masses pulled the sufferer down. I was the only shore. I was what held the speckled shells and crabs torn from the water by a screaming bird, flipped over, cracked, and eaten all at once. I am the thing that turns to sand. I live in pieces of me-shaped things. It is better to be half-buried. Thanks.